Yay. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Indie Xamarin meetup. Uh, we meet generally uh, on the, the fourth Wednesday of, or, yeah, the fourth Wednesday of every month uh, because uh, obviously last week was a holiday. We punted it to this week. So I'm glad that you were able to join us. Uh, we've got a meeting set up for gosh, what, like the next six months, Brandon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm coming it's, at it's least crazy. two more times. Them. You, you have a lot <laughs> of stuff to talk about. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so happy to have everyone here and I hope everyone had a happy holiday and, um, and that it was safe. I actually, two days before the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, got out of my COVID quarantine because I had COVID, but I'm okay oh, yeah. now. I just have like an occasional cough, but whatever. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> and there it is. Uh, let me get started. So, again, welcome to Indie Xamarin. Uh, we're brought to you by uh, Sandy Solutions, uh, Launch Fishers, MFractor, and Rev Debug. Uh, Sandy is a... a uh, uh, professional services team, um, uh, big in Indiana, growing every day, uh, great partner. Um, Launch Fishers, if we were meeting in person, we'd be meeting over at Launch Fishers, uh, but everything's virtual right now. Although I have heard that Launch Fishers is open again, it's a co-working space, um, but uh, the virtual stuff is just simply working better. Uh, MFractor, if you haven't used MFractor and you're a Xamarin developer, you, you need to at least go try, uh, get a trial. It's it's phenomenal. Um, we were just talking about how images in iOS and Android uh, often look like crap. Well, it's usually because you don't know what you're doing on iOS and Android images and dealing with MDPI, HDPI, uh, uh, XDPI, XXDPI, or whatever it is, X. XHDPI, whatever. I don't even it remember. It goes up to four X's name. now. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. X, I mean, X, like, X, 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 HDPI. Yeah, <laughs> it goes dirty with XXX, and then it just comes all the way around um, and has an integer overflow and goes XXXX. <laughs> so it's no longer dirty. The dirty meter goes to zero. Um, that was my my long winded joke that wasn't funny. Uh, and then Rev Debug, if you haven't used it. It's a really interesting tool. Uh, it'll record your entire, entire debugging session. And so you can replay it, um, variables and all. Very cool stuff. Um, so thanks to our sponsors. Uh, tonight, we've got Brandon Minnick presenting Xamarin and GraphQL. So, wow, awesome. I've, I've been fascinated by GraphQL. And uh, I think I already know Xamarin. Oh, my dog wants to be involved with the presentation. Um, so looking forward to your presentation, Brandon. I know you've been, you presented, uh, before and everyone enjoyed it and you're presenting again in the next few months. So yay. That's right. <laughs> uh, we are also part of the .NET foundation, um, and the .NET virtual user group. Uh, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, some of you that, uh, have started joining, um, maybe you, you saw the, the updated link. Uh, so I, I, we just found out that uh, some people didn't have access. Um, even if you missed it or you had colleagues or friends that wanted to come tonight but couldn't, uh, we are recording this. So you'll be able to get just watch on the on the YouTube playlist that we've got. So uh, don't worry. <laughs> you'll be able to watch this again. All right. Uh, without further ado, then I introduce Brandon to you, who is going to talk about Xamarin and GraphQL. All right. Thanks so much, Ari. So I'll go ahead and uh, pull up my screen. And before we jump into the slides, I want to let everybody know, uh, you know, don't worry about memorizing anything that we're talking about today. Uh, so first of all, I mean, this is all being recorded, so you can always check it out later. But if you have any friends that could make it or we're going to be showing off some uh, a lot of code today. So if you wanted to check out those code samples, they're all available on this website that I put together uh, just for us today. So if we go to codetraveler.io, indie, 
Xamarin GraphQL. So it's where you can find the link to the slides. You can see a video. This is a similar topic that I presented on back, <laughs> back in the good old days before COVID conferences and we had the Xamarin Developer Summit in uh, in Texas last year. And so you can watch that video. Obviously this is being recorded and then a bunch of different code samples here. So there's everything from uh, my app, Git Trends. This is an app in the App Store. Um, it helps you monitor your GitHub repos. So if you've ever been curious about how many views, clones, forks, issues, stars, all that fun stuff, getting um, on your GitHub repos, I made Git Trends to, to help with that. And it's totally open source. Like when you click the link, it'll take you to the GitHub page. And I included this in here. I mean, yes, <laughs> partly as a shameless plug because I want everybody to download my app, give it five stars, hopefully. And But also because this uses the GitHub APIs and we'll be playing around with the GitHub GraphQL APIs a little bit today. But Git Trends goes way, way deeper into using all the different APIs. And so I uh, wanted to share this with you as a, a real App Store app that's using GraphQL, all done in Xamarin, Xamarin Form, C Sharp. Um, but if you don't want to jump into that first, and you probably shouldn't if you're totally new to GraphQL, uh, we probably want to start down here with this simple Xamarin GraphQL. It's just a one-page Xamarin Forms app. We'll be putting together something similar to that today. Uh, and then there's also, I have a repo called .NET GraphQL. This is another GitHub repo that is both a Xamarin app and it shows how to make a GraphQL backend in ASP.NET Core. So lots of goodies here. And if you want to if you want to e learn even more, you're just super inspired uh, to go learn about GraphQL. I've included some links that were helpful to me when I was learning about it as well as um, if maybe you share this with a colleague and they haven't tried Xamarin yet, you can also pass along all the, the Xamarin resources for them too. But let's get into it. We only got about an hour and I could talk for days about, <laughs> about Xamarin and GraphQL. So let's jump into it. So what is GraphQL? Um, GraphQL, think of it as a query language for your API. And to really understand what GraphQL is, it always is helpful to understand why it exists. And GraphQL was actually created by Facebook. Uh, oh gosh, I think in 2012. Now, don't worry if, if you have concerns about Facebook and you don't want to use any of their tools, you don't have to. Um, I think in 2015, uh, the GraphQL Foundation took over uh, GraphQL. So GraphQL is this uh, open source technology maintained by the GraphQL Foundation. Uh, and there's tons of other companies that help contribute to it now. And that's where you can find all the different implementations of GraphQL for, like, we'll be using the one for C Sharp and .NET, but there's JavaScript implementations, Go implementations, Rust implementations, pretty much every language has GraphQL available nowadays. And like I said, it's it's all open source. This is all community run and led. And if you're familiar with the .NET Foundation, GraphQL Foundation is basically the same thing, but obviously for GraphQL. Now, why did Facebook make this? Because there was already there's already a way to make APIs, right? There's there's REST APIs, and so Facebook created GraphQL around the same time that they launched their first mobile app. And if you remember, before Facebook pushed an app to the app stores, uh, they just had a website. And then eventually they got on the mobile bandwagon, they created a native app for iOS and Android. And when they did that, they started seeing really slow performance. I don't know if you remember back in the day, but uh, the Facebook app was just brutal. Um, it's, I mean, it still is really big. I think it's 400 or 500 megabytes, but Facebook was always, um, always kind of the bottom of every joke whenever it talked to, like whenever there was apps um, or people were complaining about apps consuming too much cellular data. Uh, Facebook was always at the top of the list. Apps that consume too much battery. Facebook was always at the top of the list. So not only was it slow, but it chewed through your data plan. It chewed through your battery. And they said to themselves, 
there's got to be a better way. But you know, how do we avoid that, right? Because look at all the data that loads here when the Facebook app launches. Like when the Facebook app, uh, this is screenshots from uh, my app on iOS. And you know, I see it takes me to the stories page where I see my buddy um, talking about getting donuts with, with his son. And there's a lot of images. There's a lot of details here. So if you think about how many API calls had to be made to get all this data, to get photos of all my friends, to get the images that they posted, to get the text, the date time, uh, and then like stories here, there's more images and more text. There's just tons and tons of data that this app needs. And also when the app launches, it, lo it loads this page for your notifications. So again, more more data, more images. It's got to know all my friends. It's got to know my friends of friends so it can do this mutual friend count. There's just so much stuff that the Facebook app needs. And so when the developer is trying to figure out how to get it to use less cellular data, that's, that's when they created GraphQL. And so if you think about this problem in terms of REST API requests, um, one of the problems with REST APIs is you have this cascading request problem where when, let's say, for example, when the Facebook app before GraphQL, uh, when it's still using the REST APIs, when it first loaded, it would call this API, the user slash ID. So it would know that I'm the one logged into the app, and then it would call the ID API to get all the information about me. So that's where I can find out uh, my friends. That's where I can find out my profile images. And then once it has that, then it can expand out. So for each friend, then it's got to pull down their ID and their photos, their info, their most recent posts. Um, it's, and so you get this cascading effect where you start with one API request, but then that first one turns into a dozen requests. And then for each friend that it's going out and getting, that turns into another dozen requests. And yeah, so you almost, almost end up with this like waterfall pyramid <laughs> of API requests going back and forth. And so when the team at Facebook saw this out, um, they said, there's got to be a better way. And they consolidated, consolidated all these different REST API endpoints into one endpoint. So now when the app launches, it doesn't make multiple API requests. It just calls one API, the GraphQL API, and that one API call returns all the data that it needs. Pretty cool. But if you think about this, like how, how is this happening, right? Because in the world of uh, REST APIs, every REST API is very specific. It does one thing. But the way GraphQL works, it has this concept of a query. So there's one API endpoint for GraphQL, and we send it a query. And probably the closest um, comparison to what a GraphQL query is would be like a SQL query. Now, we're not making database queries. That's not what GraphQL does. Although, I mean, it is an API. You have a database behind the API. And there, there eventually is a database. But, <laughs> but similar to SQL, um, we would do like a SQL select. And we would tell SQL exactly what we want, which columns, how many. And that's basically what GraphQL does. So with GraphQL, we send this query to the Facebook GraphQL API, and we tell it exactly what we want. So we tell it, um, for this user ID, uh, this very specific user, uh, tell me this user's name, upcoming events count, uh, get me the first friend suggestion. And for that friend suggestion, tell me that person's name and our mutual friends count. And when I send that query to the GraphQL API, it sends back this JSON response. This is the same JSON we know and love from, from REST APIs. And you can see here that the data that came comes back is exactly the data that I asked for. So there's not any, there's no more data. There's not data that we're just gonna leave on the chopping room floor because we don't we didn't want it. Uh, and it returns back everything I need. So in this one response, we have the user for that specific ID. Turns out its name is Brandon Minnick. And I have four upcoming events count. And it came back with one friend suggestion. And it said that there's a guy named Seth Juarez who we have 18 mutual friends. And 
maybe I should send them a friend request. And so what's cool about this is this would have taken probably at least three REST API calls where I would have had to uh, make a REST API call to get my user ID. Then once I had that, I could probably make another API call to find out my upcoming events, another API call to find out my friend suggestions. But with GraphQL, one API endpoint, you pass in this query that says exactly what the data <laughs> or asks exactly for the data you want. And you can you can nest it like uh, count is actually part of this events object and uh, friend suggestions returns back a friends object. And all of that's there. We don't have to make multiple API requests. So one round trip, we get back all the data we need. There's no extraneous data. So there's not this overfetching problem as it's known in REST. And we don't have to make any more API requests. And so this is this is how the Facebook app works nowadays, thanks to GraphQL. And like I said, this response, this is just a JSON response. So exactly how we would handle response from a REST API. We would take this JSON, we deserialize it into a C-sharp object and then use it in our code. And that's the same with, uh, same is true with GraphQL. But on the left, this kind of looks like JSON at first glance, but it's not. <laughs> this is a specific query. Um, and actually GraphQL stands for graph query language. So yes, this is one of the downsides of GraphQL is you have to understand this query language, but I'm here to tell you, it's really not that scary. It's not too bad. And I wanna show you exactly what that looks like or show you rather just how unintimidating <laughs> it is by jumping over to the, the GitHub GraphQL API. If I just search for GitHub GraphQL, there it is, Explorer. And let's increase the font size here. So one of the really cool things with GraphQL, let's see, let's get to the Explorer. There it is. So with the GraphQL endpoints, you get this, this GUI for free. Uh, so I, let me connect to GitHub first, there we go. So I am signed in with my GitHub profile and anything I do right now, this is live. Like I could, I could delete a repo if I wanted to. So hopefully I don't, I don't wanna do that right now. But what's really cool with GraphQL is there's this tool called Graphical. So it's a play on GraphQL obviously, and also play on GUIs, graphical user interfaces. But this is a, a tool that we basically get for free with our GraphQL endpoints. Um, and the cool thing about it is we can start building a query here. We can get our JSON response on the right, but the coolest thing is this docs tab. So because of the way we make our GraphQL backends, we have to define all the objects that are available to return. And because of that, Graphical, this tool here is able to crawl through our schema, our GraphQL schema. Objects, all the different queries, and it basically, no, it doesn't basically, it does. It documents everything for us. And so what we get is all this free documentation. We didn't have to write a lick of docs for our GraphQL API, so super helpful. But how do we, how do we explore this now? now We'll see that there's there's two root types in when it comes to GraphQL, and this is true for every GraphQL endpoint. The two root types are always going to be query and mutation. A query is not going to make a change to the server. So think of this like a GET request. We're just asking for data. Send me data. That's my query. A mutation that will make a change server side. So that's going to be like your your put, your delete your post, your updates, anything that changes data on the server is a mutation. Anything that just requests data back from the server is a query. Figuring out how to build this first GraphQL query together, I can just click on query. And then now the docs show me everything I can query for. So this is GitHub. So <laughs> kind of everything you would expect, right? Like there, here's code of conducts, there's a bunch of enterprise tools, licenses, 
marketplaces. And then eventually we get down to things like organizations, repositories. Um, there's the search API. Um, there it is all the way at the bottom. So there's also users. So I can start building this GraphQL query here in the left just based on what I see here in the docs. And what I mean by that is this left part of or this text on the left, that's what we enter into our query. So let's start doing that as we go. So I should have copy pasted query and then dove into the query object. So now we know that we're getting a query object back, but we have to tell it what we want. Like even over here in graphical, it's giving me a little red squiggle saying, um, you told me you're making a query, but you didn't tell me what you're querying for. And like we mentioned a minute ago, GraphQL will only send you the details that you ask for. So if I want to get information about me, I can look for this user. And so again, I can copy paste this information here into my query and just replace string exclamation point with my GitHub username. So br minic. And the exclamation point just means it is required. So if I were to leave this blank, get a red squiggle here, because it's saying, uh, you're giving me a closing parenthesis, but I didn't expect that. So uh, string exclamation point just means it's required. But then again, we get another red squiggle because we haven't told the GraphQL query what information about me that we want. And so if I tried to run this, it's going to say, uh, sorry, GraphQL only gives it what you ask for, and you didn't ask for anything. You just said, I want to know about a user, but you didn't ask for any user details. So we click into the user, and these are all the things we can query for. So things like I see uh, bio, uh, avatar URL, all the, all the things you would expect to see, like company. And once we have those entered in, now we have a valid GraphQL query. And so when I run this, it'll send me back exactly the data that I, that I asked for. So I told it I want information about a user whose login is brminic, that's me. And then tell me that person's bio, tell me their URL for their avatar, and tell me the company that they work at. And, and that's what we see here. We see all, all my information. So I'm a Xamarin app developer, work at Microsoft, used to work at Xamarin. I guess that's the URL. Right, let's see if this works, actually. Just a picture of me. All right, perfect. And so, and so, yeah, this is, yes, you have to learn how to build a query, but the tools exist to build the query for you. So I've never had to just kind of guess at a query because like I said, every GraphQL API has this graphical um, GUI for free. Uh, there's also another, there's a GraphQL Playgrounds is another version of graphical, but it's all self-documenting, and you can start building your query here in the browser. So let's do a quick review before we keep going, because I know I, I threw a lot of stuff at you. But GraphQL APIs have one endpoint. So every GraphQL request uses that same endpoint. GraphQL APIs are self-documenting. So users can explore GraphQL APIs using Graphical or GraphQL Playground. Oh, we didn't actually touch on this yet. But yeah, every GraphQL request is just a post request. So good point. Forgot to show this off in Postman. So right, we just built this GraphQL query, confirmed that it runs, everything looks great. But how do you do this as an actual HTTP request, right? So let's let's pop up in Postman. Uh, Postman, if you haven't heard of it, this is just my favorite tool for uh, playing around with APIs. It lets you make uh, get requests, posts, puts, whatever. So if you ever are curious, is it is it my code that's not working or is it the API that's not working? To solve those, I always jump into Postman and then play around with the API directly. Then I can go fix my code. But yeah, let's let's make one for for the GitHub API, and 
Let's do it like, well, let me sh first show you how to set it up. I might need to authenticate by passing in a token in the header, but details, right? So the first thing we need is the URL. Let's see, what was GitHub's GraphQL API? There it is. So api.github.com slash GraphQL. And let's go forward, get my query back, make sure it still works. Great. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to a post request. Like I said a minute ago, every GraphQL request is just a post request. So whether you're doing a query, whether you're doing a mutation, it's all just post. And ironically, this is something that I, I find really interesting about this uh, ongoing battle between GraphQL and REST. I don't know if you've you've seen them, but I've seen a bunch of blog posts that are like, um, REST, REST is dead, GraphQL is the new king of APIs, or um, nobody should use REST anymore. But the, the irony in all of that is GraphQL uses REST. GraphQL is a post request. So if you know how to make a post request to a REST API, then you basically know how to do a GraphQL request because it's the same thing. So we're... We're building on top of REST. We're sitting on the shoulders of giants. REST isn't dead, but GraphQL makes it does make it more efficient. All right, so we have this query. What do we do with this query? Well, when you query a, uh, a GraphQL API, all you have to do is tell it, well, let's pass in some JSON. There we go. So we pass in some JSON, and there's just going to be one field called query. And that key value pair, so the key is query and the value is literally that query that we just figured out in the browser. Now, the only difference here is I'm going to get rid of some of this white space so it stops yelling at me. Bring all this up. And I'll have to escape these quotes. So again, it stops yelling at me. There we go. But that's it. So it's just a post request. We pass into our body um, one field called query where we just pass in the text of the query. And let's see if this lets me do it. I'm not authenticated. So let's see if I can find one that doesn't need authentication. Like um, I could probably look at a, a repo. Let's, uh, let's copy paste this. <laughs> let's see if, if this works. If that doesn't Go. work, check out the code of conduct. Oh. Whoops, forgot to copy it. So it's just code of conduct. Oh, I don't know the string key for it. <laughs> yeah, let's see if let's see if this repo will work. Uh, so name talk about get trends earlier. Downloaded today, give it five stars. Shameless plug. And then yeah, what's also cool in GraphQL, you even get IntelliSense down here. So we can see things like created at um Probably name, right? Yeah. Let's see if this works. That works. Let's see if I don't need to be authenticated. Fingers crossed. I can also just grab my <laughs> my bear token. Just didn't want to do it while I'm sharing my screen. And send it. Ah, let's see. All right, let me turn off my screen for just a second. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, I guess technically I'll I'll still be here. <laughs> Just won't be sharing any secrets with anybody today. I did that once actually in uh, the recording I shared with everybody from the Xamarin uh, Developer Summit. I did show my my token, and it was also broadcast live. <laughs> and then when I got off stage, uh, somebody had. I would say hacked into my account because I literally gave him my auth token, but somebody had gone in and I think committed some code. But the nice thing is they were they were at least nice about it. They're like, hey, just FYI, you probably shouldn't have shared this and consider this a warning. <laughs> All right, let's bring the screen back up. Run that again. And we got another error. Dang. Must be 
What am I missing here? A copy paste. Let's go back to my. Let's go back to user. And what do I do? Bio company avatar URL. Do it alive. Get rid of that white space. Escape that. Ship it. Very astrew. Oh, is it a capital Q? Is that why I'm getting yelled at? Of course. <laughs> All right. Don't don't use a capital Q. All right. So yeah. So there we go. Um, if you're from, like I said, if you're familiar with making a post request, that's all we're doing with GraphQL. The only difference is we're actually going to pass in the query that tells it exactly what we want. And what I love about this as a mobile is I don't have to make requests to the API backend team anymore. You know what I mean? Like if, if I need a different piece of data, or I want to change the shape of the data that comes back from the API with working with REST APIs. Well, that means I have to open up a ticket for my backend team. They have to build the new API. And then a couple of weeks later, we can roll this into the mobile app. But with GraphQL, because everything's available to me as the mobile developer, all I have to do is I can just, I can pull out the avatar URL and then I don't get it back anymore. Or I can add in, um, I think it's followers. Let's see if I can remember this all right. I can say, how many followers do I have? And there it goes. So like we can change the shape of the responses all without having to change anything on our back end, which is really, really cool and really, really convenient for, uh, for making mobile apps. OK, back to the review. <laughs> um, da, 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 current slide. So right. H H T T P method. And so if you know how to make a post request in C sharp using HTTP client, then you know how to make a GraphQL request. It's the same, same, same. The GraphQL request body, it's just JSON. It's always going to have one field called query, lowercase q. And then you paste in your GraphQL query that you figured out by playing around with um, the graphical tool in the browser. And the response is just JSON. It's the same JSON we know and love from REST. We get the JSON back, we deserialize it, we turn it into a C-sharp object. Happy days. All right, so let's actually let's actually write some code. I'm going to spin up a just a file new Xamarin Forms app here. So yep, blank Xamarin Forms app. And let's call this GraphQL demo. Give all this a minute to spin up. And what we'll do, we'll basically do the same thing we were just doing in Postman. We're going to make that same GraphQL request, but we're going to write it in C Sharp. So we're going to write some what I call uh, quick and dirty C Sharp code, this code. No, it's not going to follow best practices, but it'll help you envision how to use HTTP client with GraphQL. And like we were chatting about uh, early at the beginning of the meeting, all of this is, or if you want to see the good, the good code samples, the good demos, it's all already available online. I should probably grab that link. Was it Code Traveler, Indie Xamarin, GraphQL? And let's do, let's put that on a sticky note. Whoop. There we go. So yeah, if you do want to see some best practices, um, all these code samples are available here. What we're basically doing is writing this simple Xamarin GraphQL app. Let's see, do I have a screenshot of that? I do. So we're going to make something that kind of looks like this. <laughs> But like I said, quick and dirty. So let's get into this. I'm going to blow away some of the template code. 
just all do it all in one file. Like I said, no, no best practices here. It's all good. Um, so yeah, let's create main page and that'll be our content page. And let's just have a label. So main page content will be a label and we'll call this our output label. And so do label, boom. And then what we can do is let's just override on appearing. So when this, when this page, we're going to make this GraphQL request. Now, what do we need? We need a HTTP client. So new HTTP client. And and not great. You shouldn't never, <laughs> you should always reuse HTTP client. You shouldn't new it up every time, but quick and dirty code. And let's see, we need to add to this uh, some headers. So GitHub's API requires a couple headers, one of them being user agent. So let's say dot add, and that is going to be a new function value header, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what do we call this? GraphQL demo. I had to speed through the header stuff because it's not really GraphQL. This is just GitHub's API requires it. Um, we're also going to need authentication. Ooh. So let me let me hide my screen again for a second and bring in that bring in that bearer token secretly. Let's see. I will grab it from here in a different file. GitHub token. There we go. Then hide that file <laughs> and bring all my friends at the Indie Meetup back. Where'd you go? There we go. So now I can add in my authentic authentication header value. And this is just a, a bearer token. And I put it in constants. There we go. Top secret. Beautiful. So we, we have our client. Uh, now we just need to make a, a post request. So for HTTP client, it's just post async. Not too bad. Uh, but let's see. It looks like we need to bring in, I probably should have made this bigger. There we go. What do we need? We need to know the request URI. Cool. We got that. Uh, da, da, da. There it is. And we need some string content. So let's make that up here. And this is where we can pass in body. There we go. So let's just do this, paste that in. And We have to escape all these now yeah, because I did the at symbol. Still yeah. yelling at me. That's me yeah. Too. I was hoping. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping the the at symbol would just. I think for I think for like half a second your bearer token was shown, so you you no. might want <laughs> might want to oh, change yeah. it. I, I could have sworn out of, I saw it when you visited the other page. So I would I would get a new bearer token. Noted. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Everybody be nice. Uh, I thought there was an advanced thing under edit that let you do that, but I don't know if they have it under on the Mac to let you uh, fix it. Unsure. That's okay. Doesn't so matter yeah, right. Cat's out of the bag. Well, let's just do this. We'll just put this 
to our. Oh wait, no, that's just the HTTP response. And then we can now put it to the label. So now we can say text is going to be our response message dot content da, 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 read, read as a string. string. Boom. And you got to wait. All right. Let's see if it works. So, so yeah, if we did everything right, this will make our GraphQL request that we had here in Postman. So we should see this JSON response. We'll all, we'll all cross our fingers and hope it works. <laughs> oh, GraphQL is amazing. It gave you a favorite dogs app automatically. That's actually one of the sample apps. So um, that is. Ah, did I lose that? <laughs> I gotta keep, quit navigating away from all these pages. Um, so that is my .NET GraphQL sample. So I built a yeah a dog's GraphQL backend, <laughs> and that's the Xamarin app that communicates with it. Cool. Ah, we got an error. The format is invalid. <laughs> Product from Yeah, uh, that's your. Oh, I know what I did. Identifier. I know what I did. I wanted that first. There we go. Oh, good to know that uh, we still have argument checks in place in .NET. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> we we blew it. Let's see. Let's put some breakpoints on here and see what happened. So let's see. What's our string content look like? Or can we see string content? Because that's going to hide it in a byte array. Um, one thing we can try, get rid of this. And this should be the same thing though. Yeah, that'd be the same thing. Just in case. And usually what happens is I miss yeah, a curly bracket. So let's see, one. No, no, no. I think you might two, be missing the, um, the, the final, the final, um, yes, quote that part. is it. Oh. No, but I think you're missing the quote, not the the brace, but the quote. See how you have a around the um right before the the query. Oh yeah 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 yeah. So this is gonna well well let this crash and burn. Yep. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, what happened? I I don't I don't think you got all. <laughs> Let's try that copy paste again. Yep. So there's that final one. And there it Let's is. Like missing final. last time. Yeah. Copy paste, man. It gets me yep. every time. <laughs> I swear, like, probably 90% of my bugs are just copy paste errors. <laughs> that never happens. I imagine Dang. this time you could just new it up, right? You could new up a um, just do an anonymous object, and then just use uh, Newton soft JSON to just encode it for you. Yeah, that was gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be the next step. But uh, tell you what, we've been talking about these sample apps. Why not use them? <laughs> um, so. Let's see, what was it called? Sam simple Xamarin GraphQL. Quick pivot. Ship it. <laughs> All right, we'll give this a second to load. But um, 
yeah because you're totally right all right um yeah we could make like a query object have newton soft deserialize it but i figured we'd jump into some i guess we call this real code maybe the beach ball stops spinning awesome so let's go ahead and run this Make sure everything works. But what I wanted to show off is you know, how, how are we really going to write this code in our apps, right? Because um, sure, you could handwrite all these queries. You could make your own, um, make your own objects, let Newtonsoft handle all that stuff. But there is a uh, GraphQL NuGet package. And there's actually a couple, but this one is, well, this one was first. <laughs> and so it's it's the it's the old man on the block. So let's go GraphQL NuGet. Uh, so GraphQL.net, it's it's kind of the the OG GraphQL library for .NET. It is oh man, can't connect to the debugger. We'll turn it off, turn it back on. Um, yeah, so GraphQL.net. Let's go to its source repository. So totally open source. This one, I haven't looked at the the latest download numbers. A year ago, this was still the most popular, but there's a uh, a couple of new up and comers I want to show off as well. So let's see if we can get that, that code to come back and work for us this time. So I'll, I'll show you this NuGet package and how we can leverage it in our apps. I'll say in the meantime, there is Cool library called Chili Cream. <laughs> and their NuGet packages probably are nowadays the most popular. Um, Chili Cream, I think they came around a couple years ago. And they do a really good job. So uh, a lot of folks uh, prefer using Chili Cream over the graphql-.net library. Play around with all of them. You might like one better than the other. Let's see if we can finally run some code here. <laughs> but yeah, in this, we're showing off the GraphQL client. And while that's building, we can show off some code. So we're going to get back a that same GraphQL user. So we're going to make that user query. But the difference here is we're going to be leveraging, or we are leveraging, this GraphQL HTTP client library that was made for us by this GraphQL NuGet package. So let's give this app a second to launch. There it goes. Click the button to make sure everything works. Fingers crossed. All right, we did it. <laughs> so. Um, the reason I figured we just jump straight over to this, yes, everybody here can figure out how to do it using HTTP client. And you probably figured out my typo by now for why it wasn't working. But it's even easier using this GraphQL HTTP client. This is included in that GraphQL client NuGet package. So just GraphQL.client. And the nice thing about this is when we make our GraphQL requests, we can do things like, like I have this method here called get the GitHub user. And what we do, we make a new GraphQL request object. And this GraphQL request is where we pass in our query. So that's pretty similar query to the one we were playing around with. And then all we have to do is call client.sendQuery async. And here, let's remove that attempt and retry code. That's just some boilerplate code to retry the request if it if it failed. 
Um, oh, of course, it's going to give me red school down here. So I guess we'll keep it. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, we can say we can say client dot send query async, and we tell it what object we expect back for the response. So and then pass in the GraphQL request. So it'll serialize the GraphQL request for us. When the GraphQL response comes back, this is actually just another C sharp object that I made um, that it'll return the GitHub user. And that gets automatically deserialized back into C sharp for us. And then we have our data and we can like we were playing around earlier, like we can edit these queries, we can make it do whatever we want. We can get more data, we can get less data, but we don't have to edit anything on the API. We can just change the shape of our data here. Now, the I do want to give a, a, a heads up <laughs> for this library. Uh, one of the things I noticed um, when you create your uh, GitHub GraphQL client, one of the things you want to do is or one of the things we, we want to do as Xero developers is make sure that this is, well, this is under the hood. So GraphQL HTTP client, if you dig into the source code, it just inherits from HTTP client. But something I noticed is that it does not default to the native iOS and Android implementations of HTTP client. So what do I mean by that? I mean, by default, GraphQL HTTP client will not use NSURL session and it will not use the Android client handler. So what I've done here is told it, <laughs> told it to. I don't know if anybody remembers um, back in the day, we used to have to use uh, HTTP, oh, what is it called? I have it here, modern HTTP client. Um, actually, I, sh I should probably back up. If nobody knows what I'm talking about, iOS, their own way of making network calls. So essentially their own implementation of HTTP client. Same on Android, but also same in .NET. So because Xamarin uses Mono and Mono runs on top of iOS and Android in our Xamarin apps, if, if we didn't add this one line of code to use the native message handler, then the GraphQL client will default to Mono's HTTP client. And is that bad? Eh, it's not terrible. It just means you aren't using the native networking stack. So your networking calls are going to be just a little bit slower. Um, you're not going to get some of the security protocols that are baked in to um, NSURL session on iOS or the Android message handler on Android. So always recommend using the native, uh, I guess we'll call them the native HTTP client stacks. And that's why. I've I pass this in here using modern HTTP client so we can we can still force it to do all of our awesome Xamarin things. But um, hey, Brandon, there were a yeah. couple of questions. I missed them. Mm. Uh, one was from uh, Juarez, and he was saying, you think maybe verbatim strings are a good idea for these GraphQL queries? I think we already covered that. Um, so this is something that... So, I mean, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the fact that you only will type this string once. Um, like, I'm with you. I don't like hard-coded strings either. But um, this isn't something that you're going to be editing a lot. It's not something that's going to be changing a lot. Like, once you figure out the GraphQL query, you basically plug this in and forget it. But at the same time, this is one of the reasons why Chili Cream has become so popular is they have a way to essentially have type safe queries. So you don't have to hard code the string like this. Um, you can build everything in JSON files and then import it into your app. And it's it's kind of a better way to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, Chili Cream has become the most popular because mm -hmm. yeah, hard coded strings kind of suck. <laughs> well, the other thing that you could do if you don't want to use Chili Cream is you just create a string resources file and just, you know, put named queries in there. And then, you know, it's actually easier to edit. You wouldn't even have to worry about all these little options. Yeah, totally. There's So yeah, there's a couple ways around it. There's a lot of ways, um, right? <laughs> but so yeah, good question. question. 
Yeah, the, the other question was, have you ever used the GraphQL query type in Postman? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this one's kind of cool. Um, in case nobody else has seen it. So we were doing everything in raw JSON, kind of like we would for REST APIs. But yeah, about a year ago, they added the GraphQL, I guess, button toggle here. And so what we could have done is, let's see if I can, <laughs> I'm copying and pasting again, man. Hold, hold your breath. Um, we can, we could have copy and pasted this query. You know, again, the same query that we figured out using graph graphical <laughs> and let's bring back some of this white space. Render, enter. Da, 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 da. That, that, and then, yeah, we could have sent it like this and we get back the same result. So yeah, Postman actually has GraphQL functionality. Let's minimize that a little bit, uh, baked into it, which is also really cool. Um, and I don't, yeah, you know, I don't know if this is correlated or not, but I wrote a blog post. Um, oh, we still have it up. I wrote a blog post about how to use Postman with GraphQL. This was a couple of years ago and I was first playing around with GraphQL, um, almost exactly two years ago. And so walk through this, basically everything we just did, right? Like here's graphical and then here's how to do it in Postman. And then um, this was actually like featured, like Postman, um, I guess included this in their newsletter, blah, blah, blah. And shortly afterwards, they they added in this new functionality. So yeah, it looks like I never even updated this blog post to <laughs> include that in Postman, but um, but yeah, it is a really cool feature, albeit it doesn't necessarily help us learn GraphQL. Cause again, we would hit the same problem here, right? Like, okay, great. We have this query, but then what do I do in C-sharp? What do I do in .NET? Like, how do I use this with HTTP client? And so, yeah, that's why I still like to show off just the raw JSON format. Cause well, at least for me, that's how my brain works. My brain works in, in JSON. <laughs> Good question. What else? Of course, I went and grabbed some water right when you asked that question. Uh, that, that I think that was the those were the only two questions. But let me double check. Those were the only two questions right now. Thank you. Okay, right on. Oh, let's see. What can we show off? Oh, we should show off. Um, how to do the backend stuff. So that, <laughs> everything we've talked about so far was all from the client side. So it's all, how do we consume GraphQL using our Xamarin apps, but we haven't seen an example of the backend code. And so that's, that's what .NET GraphQL is. So let's load that up in Visual Studio. Uh, there we go. And so, yeah, this was the app we got a sneak peek of earlier, um, where this has back end code, front end code for the mobile client. Got, um, let's see, what are we using back here? So, yeah, it's all the same GraphQL libraries. The But the biggest difference is on the mobile side, we're using GraphQL client, whereas on the server side, we can just use, well, we do uh, use GraphQL. And so let's go ahead and run this first and let's kick off the API here in the terminal. So this is .graphql, nope, capital N, slash what, source, and .graphql.api. So we'll go ahead and run the API in the background and we'll launch the Xamarin app. And yeah, you'll get a sneak peek at all my favorite dogs. I might even have it. Nah, it's not installed on iOS yet. 
while that's launching, uh, Yao has a question. Um, there isn't a way to create a model with the fields data you want to receive. So instead, uh, type the query you just send the mo I'm not sure what you mean, Yao. Do you, do you want to just ask the question? It should be a Yeah, sure. So, yeah, sorry. Sorry about my bad English. <laughs> so <laughs> what I mean is, instead of uh, just uh, type the, the, the query, you know, you just, you just save the, the model, uh, you have a class with the, the, the fields you want to, to get, you know, like a string name, uh, count um, int uh, user count or fields count, you know. Um, like like the, the when you receive you you pass that data to uh, that JSON to a to a model, right? Uh, you have you have, you right. have to you need to have a, a model with the, the same field that that uh, that you are going to receive, right? So should be a way to to make that, but you know uh, send that model. Uh, I don't know if you understand my question. Sorry. Uh, I mean, if let me, let me repeat it back. I, I think I'm tracking with you. Because yes, like you said, um, the response comes back and we need to have a class for that. So for example, exactly. in this app, I've got my dog images, GraphQL yeah. response model that takes in a I enumerable of dog images. And exactly. that's where I can see like the breed, the birthday, the coat color. Um, so what I meant is to have a class just like that, but to uh, send it, you know, so. Uh, right, so that's well, and that's and that's a tough part with GraphQL because this is not JSON, so we're not pa we're not s passing in JSON, so we can't use Newtonsoft JSON to serialize a model and then turn that into a query. And honestly, if you can figure out how to do that, if you can figure out how to take a model and create a GraphQL query out of that, you'll be a GraphQL millionaire because. That oh, is honestly okay. the biggest problem I see right now um, that I think Chili Cream will say does a pretty good job of solving. It's not exactly mm -hmm. like that, but yeah, but yeah, being able to serialize a C sharp model into a GraphQL query is exactly the tool I want. So, so yeah, yeah. Juan, if you, if you create that, send it to me and you All can right. probably charge <laughs> a lot of money for that. <laughs> cool. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I, I love that question though, because that's that was the first thing I thought of too when I started playing around with this. I was like, wait a minute, like I have the model. Can I just use that to build the query? And eventually I just gave up. <laughs> All right. So sorry, we have our list of dogs. We would do a pull to refresh. Um, we see the API running here, so we should see activity in the terminal. Yep. So everything's working. Great. Um, this is all leveraging again, just this is Xamarin forms. I like to do all my Xamarin forms in C sharp. Uh, not a big fan of XAML, but yeah, basically it's just a refresh view inside of that refresh view is a collection view. And when we do a pull to refresh down to our view model, da, 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 that's where we're calling this get dogs images from our GraphQL backend. So that's where we go full circle all the way back to our, our code here. And we send in our, our queries for, in this case, dogs. And we can get the avatar URL, the birthday, the breed, all that fun stuff that we can see here. And what happens if you click a dog? Oh yeah, because their Instagram page. All right. So that's actually, that's my dog Kirby. You can follow him on Instagram. He's great. <laughs> so um what does this look like on the server side so this is um <clears throat> so i should fill you in i made this app because i couldn't find a lot of good server side examples of graphql um and let's see this does have 
graphical running. And so if I remember correctly, I think I can jump straight into it. Oops, paste. Ah, oh, copy again. Copy, paste. I'm pretty sure this will pull up graphical. If not, then I've, I'm blanking on the, uh, the URL off the top of my head. But, but anyways, so yeah, we just, uh, the biggest thing here is in the, in the, in the startup class. And this is where we have to define a couple things. Like we have to add in our schemas. So everything in GraphQL is, let's try that one more time. Maybe an edge. Let's see. Still running? It is still running. Man, there must be another URL I'm missing. But, but yeah, so everything in GraphQL is called a schema. And the schema just defines the data that can come back. So when we were looking at the data explorer in graphical, all, all that information comes from these schemas. And the way this works in .NET GraphQL is you create a class that inherits from this GraphQL type schema, and then you tell it what it is. So this is, in this case, this is a query. Um, it could be a mutation, but for the for this, we made it a query so we can return back the information about the dogs. We can do dog queries, and we just have to create this query. I guess it's called a, an object graph type. And so uh, this is where we define everything that we would see in, in graphical. And man, I wish I wasn't blanking on the URL for that. Oh, maybe it's, oh, because that was port 500? Maybe if I go 8080? Port 5000 was what you were running. Is it like Swagger where it's, you know, like sw slash graphical? Yeah, that's what I don't remember. <laughs> Shoot, I should have written that down. Um, yeah. But all that's in here, it's all... Uh, it's cool. So like, let's see if I can search the code real quick. Ah, nothing even came back. Dang. Maybe slash index. Can you just try slash GraphQL? <laughs> Still nothing. Oh, well, I was hoping for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, because yeah, what we could what we could do is play around with these um, Matt Hall this asked images query in live in the startup class. What's that? Uh, Matt Hall was asking if it's defined in the startup class. It's where is I know Swagger just does something like that, and Swagger config. Ah, it's somewhere in here. I'm just looking at, we've only got eight minutes left, so I didn't want to spend too long digging into this. But we can just focus on the code. Um, <laughs> so so right, when, you, when you define your schema, uh, you just have to tell it exactly what you're going to pass back. And so what we can do, we can do a little crossover with um, that GitHub API Explorer. We'll pretend like this is the one we're <laughs> the one we're working on right now, but um, wait for the docs to load. Come on, docs! There they are. So, okay. so let's go back a step. Uh, da, da, da. To this, right? So we created this schema. And Juarez is asking, is there any support for EF core? Oh, yeah, that's not. Um, I mean, any framework core is just a, a database ORM. And so, yeah, you can use whatever you want to, to talk to your databases. And actually, I'll show you where we wire that in in just a second. But, um, but yeah, so we, we made a query. So 
if we were looking at our API and we click clear, query here, this is where we would see our images query. So we would see it, um, we would see it called images query, but then what the way we define it is with these graph types. So I made this dog images graph type and we pass in this dog images model. So let's, let's show some of these side by side. So what this graph type does is it defines what the API will return. So I created a couple fields here um, for the dog's breed, for the dog's birth date, for the dog's coat color. And you can also tell it other things like um, that comma false is, well, I can't really see the, <laughs> let's see, there we go. So like, ah, oh, shoot. Anyways, is it is it nullable or not? Like, is it required to the, um, does every dog image have to pass that back? And the reason we, we defined this, like this does look like a bunch of duplicate code and it kind of is because there's already a breed defined in our dog images model. And there's already a coat color defined in our dog images model. But let's pretend this, these weren't pictures of dogs. Maybe this is um, username. And like this is password, right? So what we can do is we can make sure password isn't exposed in our GraphQL API. So it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping of our model to our GraphQL API or our, our GraphQL graph type. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, we go through and we define everything we want to expose on our API for this specific model. And, and then we can define all the different ways that we're going to send the data back. So this is where I want to get to the, the question we were just asking about, like, how can we hook up our database, right? Well, we literally create a GraphQL um, query here. So this is list graph type for dog images graph type. So this means it's going to return a list of our dog images. And then here is where we just pass in information about this API. So in the same way here where we have details about the API saying like, here's its description. Um, and this is what the query is called. It's, this query is called code of conduct and it has a description called lookup code of conduct. Well, I named mine dogs and I said, this is a query for dogs. But the way that data gets back or the way we give that data back to the user is we have these resolvers. So you'll see the word resolvers all over GraphQL, uh, especially if you're creating a GraphQL API. And a resolver is just where does the data come from? So in this case, I just have a bunch of static data. I just have this dog images. This is all just static data, but a resolver can point to a database. So this is where it can point to EF core. Um, a resolver could point to another API. You could literally have your GraphQL API sit on top of your REST APIs. So um, you never have to get rid of your REST APIs. But if you want to add GraphQL on top of that, which is essentially what GitHub did, you can totally do that. And so, so yeah, it's these resolvers where you tell it how to get the data. Hey, Brandon. Matt out that there's a screenshot in the repo that the example is using localhost 4000. Oh, where? Oh, and that's 10.2.2. .2 .2. Oh, man. Oh, that's worth a shot. <laughs> and there's there's no slash anything. Uh, it just says localhost 4000. You could try localhost 5000. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well. Ah. ah. Hey. Teamwork. Boom. Okay. This is going to be awesome. So, yeah, really quick. So, here's our docs. Zoom in. Ah, so much nicer. Um, let's see if we can do this side by side. Cool. So yeah, this is where we can see I made a, let's see, 
So this one called dogs, right? That's because I named it dogs here. And I said, this is a query for dogs. And then it just returns all the dog images. And in this GraphQL query documentation, these square brackets define that it's going to be a list of dogs. So you know exactly what to get back. And kind of like I was saying earlier, uh, maybe we don't want to expose certain dog data. Like right now, we're given the avatar URL, website URL. But yeah, maybe we don't want to show the website URL. What I can do is just comment out that code. Basically, don't expose it. And then when we rerun this, there it goes. So we, re re whoa, we rerun it, and we look at the dog object again. And now there is no website URL. So this is how we define all the fields that come back. Uh, again, the exclamation point means it's required. It's not nullable. Um, the square brackets mean it's a list. So that's how we have like this list graph type of a non-null graph type of string <laughs> that turns into a list of required strings. And uh, let's see, jumping all the way back to here. And this is where we can see all these different queries. So the other one being like a one field is a list of dog images graph type called dogs by coat color or breed. And so this tells the user to pass in information about the coat color. So maybe it's brown or maybe it is um, golden retriever, and it'll filter the results back for that specifically. So um, that one's a little bit more complicated, like because you have to pass in, we have to define those query arguments, right? We have to say that that query is going to be a string. And then we can also say that the name of that string is going to be called coat color. So we have coat color. And then we can even include a little description like dog coat color. But again, we just kind of pass all that information to the resolvers. And what we get here is we have to pull that information out. So that coat color string, we get that argument, we get the breed string. And then I have this method here that basically checks the data for, or checks what we got from the user and then passes back the data from a link query. So let me pause there. It's the top of the hour. I'm happy to hang around for a little bit longer and answer any questions, but um, I, I definitely had a question. <laughs> oh, sure. So a, a couple items here. One, how do you handle versions of the of the graph? You know, so I don't see anything. Yeah. Like call version 1.0 of this. So like if I started, oh, we accidentally, you know, we, we made some security changes. We no longer want to pass back the middle name of the dog. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, because that could be a security question. So we're sure. going to get rid of that. Well, simply getting rid of it would break a whole bunch of apps, right? So how do you handle versioning? Well, I'm glad you asked. So there, there's a couple different options here. Um, let's see if they have it. Uh, no, I wanted like the official GraphQL docs. Okay. But... Basically, so there's there's two different things going on. There's um, the there's adding stuff to your API, and there's removing stuff from your API. So if, if we're just adding something, then you don't need to version it because it didn't it wasn't a breaking change. And let's see, what did I say in versioning here? I'm a stickler though. If you add. <laughs> It's it's a new version because it's it's a new capability that wasn't there. So, um, yes and no. It's I, I'm, I'm only a Sith deals in absolute. <laughs> it it is, but um, do you? Because so then you'd have to have a new endpoint. You'd have to update all the clients. When really is all that work necessary? Not really. Uh, it was version. Uh, it was version two of the endpoint, you know. I mean, I wouldn't get rid of version one. 
I would communicate out version one is going away. This is when it will go away. And, you know, going forward, this is what you use. But yeah, yep. I mean, it, it all lots, depends. Lots of extra work if, if you want to do that. But um, yeah, I'm trying to find this example of how to mark your stuff obsolete. Um, not seeing it here on the fly, but yeah, there, there is a way to say that uh, something has, has gone away. And I'm just not finding it here off the top of my head. Probably not using the right keyword. Um, I mean, okay. I say, <laughs> you name GraphQL queries, right? Say that one more time, Ari. Versioning GraphQL queries or versioning GraphQL endpoints. Although there's only one endpoint, but. Ah, there we go. So, so it looks like it's just is deprecated is true. Um, but yeah, I was hoping to find a, an actual example. I wonder if there's something in. I mean, I guess I you know, just the GraphQL repo, but multiple GraphQL endpoints, you know, each responds to, you know, just has different resolvers, right? And you can, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah you I mean, get, you could totally do that. You could um, have V1 of your GraphQL well, endpoint, you could have yeah. V2, <laughs> um, but there, there are tools like this, um, this deprecation built into, oh, they have a, a GIF right here. So, so that gets rolled up into the docs. Um, I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head what happens when you call a deprecated uh, GraphQL field, if it still resolves or if it will fail, or maybe it'll point you to the updated yeah. stuff. But, but yeah, there, there is a way to, to deprecate your API. So you don't have to go through all the versioning unless you really want to. You're still more than welcome to create another version. Yeah, so I, I only had I had one other question, but did anyone else have any other questions? Feel free to unmute if you have a question. Uh, the the other question I had is, what are the? I clearly I mean, you've got everything you know, with static data. You're not really going to see a performance issue there, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you know, what are the gotchas for wiring this up to a database? You know, like use, whether it's EF Core or DAP or whatever the heck you want to use, um, what kind of planning should go in so that it remains performant? And you don't you don't over over uh, fetch <laughs> on the right. server side just to filter it so you can send it to the client side. And you use up all of your server resources, <laughs> not being careful. Yeah, so actually that's one of the cool things about GraphQL is we'll say if you do it right, um, your GraphQL API will always be more performant than your REST API because yeah. your GraphQL API is very specific and it knows exactly what it needs. And one example is you might have a REST API that you call to pull back some data, but it sends you more data than you need. and on the back end, that REST API might be pulling data from two different databases. Well, since GraphQL knows exactly what you need, it's smart enough to know that I don't need to call this, or I don't need to make a second database query. I, don't, I only need to call or pull data from one table. And so you do get that performance boost. And yeah, I mean, I think probably at the highest level, you're gonna have the same concerns about um, uh, caching things, um, yeah. uh, what's that called with, um, uh, whether the data is saved right away or cached or oh, it's I'm blanking on the road. Yeah. Um, well, I, what I, I was talking about but... though wasn't really, I, I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. I'm, I'm talking about, you're, you're, you're saying that GraphQL just, you know, if you use GraphQL, it'll automatically know what to go and 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 get from whichever database. But I don't 
I'm not sure that's true, right? I mean, you need to set up those resolvers to be able to do all that work, and then you get all those capabilities. So I'm wondering yep. if that's if that's the case, what are the things that you need to think about when planning a GraphQL implementation, you know, the server implementation, so you you don't run into issues? Um so let's let's come at that from a couple of different ways. I Just would the nature of it. Yeah. My so like my first problem. recommendation is if if this is a brownfield application that already has a REST API, you can place a GraphQL API on top of it and have all those resolvers point to your REST APIs. Um, so you can essentially, I don't want to say mock out, but you can leverage the existing REST APIs with GraphQL queries. And again, as mobile developers, that makes our lives easier because um, we only have to make one API call instead of multiple round trips and we get exactly the data we need. So that would be the the first thing I'd do. Like if I was upgrading an app, I would just slap a GraphQL endpoint on top of uh, my REST endpoints. But, um, but yeah, I mean, when, I mean, I, I, think, I think you already said it, Ari, is yeah, it's, it's all in your resolvers. So if you know certain data lives in certain tables and you don't need to do a join, then including that logic in your resolvers, uh, make sure that uh, you don't have to deal with it. But every app's going to be different. And really, I would build it first and see what you need to optimize. Because a lot of time we spend too much time over optimizing and we're kind of oh, guessing. Sure. <laughs> and if we only have a couple hundred users, and we're like, if we were Facebook scale with a couple billion users, then yeah, <laughs> optimize the hell out of it. But yeah, um, you got a billion dollar budget at that point too for your research, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, it's I I would say it's probably best to figure out where those where those bottlenecks are. Is everything is is anything even slow? Because um, it might just be good enough. But yeah, I mean. When you start going through those optimizations, that's that's a big one. So like those database queries, not to overfetch from the database, not to make too many calls to the database. And because we know what these queries return, um, we can we can add some of that logic into our resolvers, which is which is nice because we know exactly what the user wants. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I'm yeah, I'm just curious about setting it up. Yeah, you know, so I guess if I dive in there, I'll I'll be able to figure it out. I'm just just curious, you know, about any pitfalls and setting it up, you know. Yeah, um, I think just probably the biggest one, and we touched on it earlier, is just you don't have to expose everything in your model. You don't have to expose like you can be very specific about what you do and do not expose, so that you don't accidentally give some give away somebody's login information or PII or anything like that. Yeah. Don't and, um, your bearer token. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. OK, yeah, that answers my question. Uh, did anyone else have any other questions? Uh, it looks like, yeah, I'll put. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, I'll have to read about that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I never worked with GraphQL before, and uh, actually, this this seems much much better than uh, REST API. Um, I'm going to start uh, working on the on, on my new job, and uh, I think this makes all sense to 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 uh, to, to query data like this. You know, uh, it, it looks like uh, you are querying directly the database. You know. Make sense. So. Yeah, I agree. And I I I'm a big believer that everything will move to GraphQL. So kind of like how today everything is well, most everything is REST and JSON. And like if Ari came to me and was like, Hey man, can you help me with my my SOAP API? I'm having trouble parsing the XML. I'd be like, Ari, what are you doing on SOAP? You gotta get on REST. WCF. Um, 
the best. <laughs> yeah, WCF. It's yeah, the I, bomb. <laughs> I I really believe five ten years from now, every endpoint will offer a GraphQL API, and it's just because of all these all these efficiencies, and not just in like, well, yeah, you know, there's the the data efficiency, like we only have to make one round trip on our on our mobile app, we get all the data we want, and that's great. But also just like the backend efficiencies, like you don't need people building out new REST API endpoints every time you need to change the shape of the data. Uh, you don't have to do as much work on the backend once it's set up, which is nice for everybody. You don't have to write the docs. The docs are all self-documenting. There's Lots of bonuses, and um, uh, that's why I think GraphQL will kind of be the the default five ten years from now, unless something else comes out. <laughs> yeah, which I guess is inevitable, huh? Yeah, technology. <laughs> well, awesome. Hey, you know, it, it doesn't look like there's any other questions right now. Brandon, as always, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, oh, and the moment I said that, Matt, nah, Matt. Question. come on, Matt, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so what about doing something, yep. building your own GraphQL endpoint in an Azure function that could be a proxy to whatever other API you're calling? Yeah, no, exactly. That's yeah. I mean, it sounds like something uh, you just, just like calling another API, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's and and that's exactly what a lot of companies are doing is they're just putting a REST or a GraphQL API in front of their REST API. So the REST APIs are still available. All the existing legacy apps can still target the REST APIs, but your new code can target the GraphQL API, even though under the hood, the resolvers are, <laughs> the resolvers are all just pointing to the existing REST APIs. So you don't have to worry about any of like, you know, the database optimizations like we were talking about earlier. You don't have to worry about uh, authentication stuff because all that will get passed through to the REST APIs. And yeah, it's just a really easy way to stand up GraphQL endpoint, start leveraging it from your mobile apps. Your mobile apps will become faster, but you didn't really have to change anything. <laughs> so yeah, Matt, I love that idea with, especially with Azure Functions because they don't, they're serverless. They don't need to be running 24 seven and yeah, they could totally be used as a proxy. That's a great idea. Nice. Well, cool. Uh, okay, I'm I'm gonna wait ten seconds. <laughs> cut cut them off, dads. <laughs> You've got to cut it. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, ag again, Brandon, I can't thank you enough. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, um, uh, for those of you that joined, thank you for joining. Uh, this will be uploaded, so if you want to share it with anyone, uh, feel free. And um, yeah, and and look forward to Brandon's upcoming presentations. We do not have another presentation this month. This is just we just moved the November one to the first week of December due to the holiday. But we do have things lined up uh, January through I think June of next year. And uh, we wow. did reschedule the um, the <coughs> excuse me the shell UI presentation for next year. That's that's squared away too. So for those of you that wanted to see that, that has been rescheduled. Uh, yay! Well, thanks. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now, Brandon. Thanks again, everyone. Be safe. Have a happy holidays, and uh, talk with you next year. Bye, everybody. <laughs>